God, his glory, his Shekinah glory to fill this place. So let's just worship this morning as we usher into his presence.
in your presence this morning, God. Let us leave different than when we arrived, God, that we know a change has happened in our life, God. You know our needs. We know our needs, God. I give them to you this morning, God. Come and change me, Lord Jesus. Fill this place with your presence, God. Come in, Lord, and do what you have come to do this morning, God. We can't do it without you, Lord. We cannot be changed without your presence, God. Touch us, I pray. Touch us, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing right now in this place, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Going a little old school this morning with no, not one.
and it feels good in here. I'm so thankful for God's goodness, God's presence, amen, that is here with us, and we're thankful for that, amen. Um, just the first announcement I want to get out of the way quickly, just so we're aware of it tonight. Uh, as probably many of you know, there is supposed to be a significant storm front moving in later today, and so we will be shifting online for uh, tonight. We're going to take advantage of the fact that Pastor Craig, who is the speaker for the main church tonight, and uh, Brother Nick, they live on site, and so we've got a tech guy, and we've got a preacher, and so um, make sure to uh, join in our evening service tonight at 6.30 p.m., um, either uh, on Facebook at Emmanuel Lighthouse or on the Emmanuel Lighthouse YouTube channel. Those of you that are a part of our Pentecostals of Renfrew, we will be going um, online for that, except for we'll be doing it in the format of uh, going into a Google Meet, and so we still have the opportunity to, uh, for us to read scriptures together to be as a part of the Bible study, to interact, other people to be involved, and so if you're a part of Pentecostal Renfrew or want to join us tonight, you can, um, there is a, on the Facebook page, there is this information as well, but you can either go to that address or scan that QR code, and uh, it will take you right to the Google Meet for uh, tonight, and so 6.30 p.m. we'll be meeting there, and we'll be doing our Bible study. We're going to get uh, the testimony from Brother Frederick about his conversion story, um, and so it's going to be a great time, and there's going to be a great service uh, for the main church as well here tonight. And we're going to, um, you know, we're going to be able to say, let it snow, as long as it doesn't, you know, take out the power and the internet, then then we have, a, we have another problem, but uh, that, that's one that's kind of has to be solved by God, but... And we're going to do our best to accommodate working with that. Now, uh, scheduled for tomorrow is a shopping trip to Ottawa. I'm assuming, Sister Helen, that that, that is not happening now. Okay, so um, anyway, and so if, if you were planning on doing all of your shopping on that trip, you may need to make alternate plans um, or go online. Seems like everything else we're doing. But uh, December 5th, that's Tuesday night, we will be back in service. And uh, on Tuesday night, I will be doing a, a lesson about Israel, why Israel is such a big deal right now, why there's so much hatred for Israel, what our response should be, and why we should have that response. I think it's a really important topic, considering the time in which we live, and it does tear into what we've been talking about in terms of the spirit of Antichrist and the, the work that's happening in our world right now, and where this Israel conflict and the response around the world, where it fits into all of that. So join us on Tuesday night for that. On December the 8th, there is a youth dinner out, and next week is uh, our normal Sunday morning service, and then Sunday evening is the Christmas concert. That is at 6 p.m., not 6.30, but 6 p.m. for the Christmas concert, and we are asking that every family would bring a dessert for that evening for the meal afterward, and asking that it be pre-cut, basically ready to serve, wrapped on a tray or a plate or something to where it can just be sat out and served without more prep work here. And, and so uh, just remember that. A little bit further out, I do want to let you know that on Christmas Eve, which falls on a Sunday this year, we'll be having an a.m. service and no p.m. service. And so not a, a candlelit e evening service, but an a.m. service. So make your plans to join us uh, for that day. Also, looking ahead into the new year, one of the things that we are going to be doing in the new year is relaunching our small groups. We call them light groups. We, were, we had had them up and running before the pandemic, and they've never really come back alive yet. So I'll be back to you with more details about that. But if you're interested in being involved in small groups as far as the kind of leadership team, I'm look, they're going to have some senior leads, but then also a, a support staff in each one of these small groups. And I'm hoping to involve some people that, that want to be mentored and want to be a part, and this is a great opportunity for that. And we're going to address some really, in the various groups, there'll be some really important things that we'll be talking about, and, uh, and a variety of things, from, from some Sunday school, you know, training for those that want to be involved in Sunday school, to parenting and, and other things, and so just some necessary things that we, we need, and it's a great time in a small group to make friends, to get to know people better, and, and that's really important that as the church continues to grow, that we're connected to people and not just a face in the crowd. 
And so we want to encourage you to be a part of that in the new year. And then I do want to thank uh, a few people this week that were once again big helps for various things. I want to thank Sister Abbott for her help in doing all of the planning and preparation for our leadership meeting that happened on Friday evening as we set the schedule for the first half of 2024. So thank Sister Abbott for that. And then also uh, I want to thank some others that were held here for for Joe, uh, Pastor Craig, uh, Krista that came and helped out and uh, just furthering more of the work over there. We appreciate everyone that continues to lend a hand. It is so great to be a part of a, a church where people are engaged and ready to work for the kingdom of God. And I do want to also say it's great to have uh, Pastor Nick back home and glad that he is back safe. It's also great to have Gordon here with us again this morning and glad that he's here. Amen. And if I, is, is it Japan here with us today? It's great to have you here with us. God bless you. And I believe Bolu back with us. God bless you. And uh, glad that, that you're here as well. And to see everybody here in God's house, appreciate you so much and your faithfulness to his house. And then finally, before I get out of the way and we're going to move on to more worship, uh, tithes and offerings, I do want to mention uh, Christmas for Christ, which on the table as you came in out in the outer lobby, there is uh, envelopes there. And again, don't get too caught up on the amount that's on the envelope. It's um, you can put whatever amount you either in that or give it online. But our goal is for everyone to be involved in giving our best gift of the season towards Jesus and Christmas for Christ. All of the funds go directly into just planting new churches and establishing new churches in North America, spreading the gospel, and and so continuing the mission, the great commission that Jesus gave to us. And so I want to encourage you all to be a part of that, and we're believing that some of the new churches that we're going to start are going to be some of those that are going to receive funds in the future to help them get off the ground. And so we're very glad to be a part of that. And then also I do want to take a moment to acknowledge our birthdays for the week. Sister Joy McRae has a birthday this week, and then also Grace Taranga has a birthday this week. And uh, so, she seems surprised, but I, she just told me her birthday like a week ago, so she shouldn't be all that surprised. Let's sing for her here today. Amen. Once you give, you can stand. You're going to want to. Change me, see, I'm 
Hallelujah. Amen. That's the most thrilling thing of all, of knowing that we heard it from uh, just a week ago from, from Pastor Craig, I believe, that the thing that we should rejoice of is not the spiritual victory that we have or being able to command demons, but rather that the greatest thing is that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is the most precious thing. Amen. You can be seated here this morning. We're going to go this morning to God's Word. And this is a message, actually, I've had ready to go for over a month. I was going to preach it on a Tuesday night, probably five weeks ago or so, and I got COVID, and I wasn't at church. And so I didn't preach it. But uh, I, it's, since that point, it's continued to percolate and uh, some new uh, threads and details that I felt to add to it. And so I am believing that this is a message for this day. It obviously was not a message for that day. It's a message for today. We're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, begin reading at verse 9 here today, a passage that I love that speaks of how special we are through God. And it says, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. Everyone say, out of darkness. Into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy speaks of that glorious transformation that happens in our lives when we are called out of something and called into something. And today's message is about the middle of that, that transformation process that God wants to do in our lives. And I'm going to preach to you this morning on the subject, Uncommon. Amen. And so let's go to the Lord right now. I'm going to ask Pastor Kingsley to pray for God's word, that God would speak to us today. name. Amen. Amen. I do want to say this morning, it's good to see Victoria here as well. God bless her. Amen. When I say the word holy, people are fine with that. They're typically, they're ready to, you know, used to talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, uh, talking about a holy God. But when you start talking about us being a holy people, then people get a little bit more nervous. But yet throughout Scripture, there is a command that is repeated from Exodus to Revelation in both Testaments that calls for us to be holy because God is holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Holiness, if you begin to explore the Word of God, you find that holiness is God's primary attribute. In fact, if you want to know who the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is God. God is a spirit, Scripture says, and God is uniquely holy. In Him, there is light and no darkness at all. God has no sin. God has nothing that's creeping in that perverts His character. He is utterly holy. Holy, He is righteous in all of His dealings. Um, and uh, because the goal of this is for us to become like God, the problem is, is throughout much of history, humans have tried to make up gods that act like them. And it's not much fun when your God acts like you. <laughs> I don't know if you figured that out, but there are times, that if you'll ever notice, for example, those of you that have multiple children, there's a good chance that the one that you fight with the most is the one that's like you. They push all of your buttons because it's the same buttons that you have. And so as a byproduct, uh, you get along worse with the one that's most like you. We often think, oh, if everyone would just be like me, what a wonderful world it would be. It's not true. We are wonderfully, uniquely made, and I'm thankful for each and every one of us, but there's a reason why God makes one of us 
and not whole squads of drones of us, but God makes us uniquely in his image. And so the goal here is not to try to conform God to us, but rather for us to be transformed to become more like God. Less of us, less of our flaws, less of our sin and our shortcomings, and more of his holiness. Holiness is God's primary attribute. In fact, every time that we have a look into the throne room of God, the presence of God, we see that there are angelic beings, cherubim, seraphim, that are around his throne. And in a continual round, they are saying, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it is a continual wave around him because God is holy. Holy, And everything else in God derives from that holiness. God is love, but God doesn't love everything. God doesn't love sin. In fact, he hates sin. God doesn't love the devil. Neither should you. But God's love is directed by his holiness. The very fact that there is sin and can be defined as sin is because God is a holy God. And so God looks at sin and doesn't look lovingly and longingly at it, but rather God looks with hatred upon sin. And so the more that we become like him, the more that we learn to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates. It's not just about love. Christians are, are quickly to attribute love, and love is very important. Love is our primary identifier. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples because of your love one for another. That love is incredibly important, but it's only one half of the coin. You can't really love as God loves unless you hate what God hates. And that may be a little too complex a thought for you to dissect this morning, but chew on it for a little while. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 6 and 16. It says, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? God doesn't love idols. It says, for you are the temple of the living God. Don't mix God's temple, your body, with the idols of this world. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Then chapter 7, verse 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, the things we have just read, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In this context, the word perfecting, uh, it doesn't mean that we are going to obtain perfection, because only God is perfect. But perfecting means that it's a maturing process in our lives. Uh, to put it very simply, the longer that I serve God, the more I should resemble Him. In my thoughts, in my words, in my appearance, in my actions, in the way that I direct and show love. The spiritual growth or the spiritual maturity process is literally a holiness process. We are becoming less like who we were B.C., before Christ, and we are becoming more like him. So what is holiness? How can we become holy? Ezekiel 42 and 20 says it this way. It says, he measured it, talking about the temple. He measured it on the four sides. It had a wall all around 500 cubits long and 500 wide. And the purpose of this wall, the Bible says, is to separate the holy areas from the common. We're talking about being uncommon here today, so first we need to understand what is common. Now, people's eyes start to glaze over, and you read the various passage in Scripture where it starts to talk about the design of the tabernacle or the temple, and you know, when you're reading along, you've been reading some exciting story, and it's like, oh yeah, the Bible's great. And then you hit this section, it's just pages long, where it's talking about how long everything was, and the, the design and the decoration was here, and what materials it was made out of. And it reads like a blueprint, and unless you're really, really into construction, you're looking at that and saying, now why do I need to know that? But there is one reason here that we can understand the purpose of what God is describing, because there are the Bible says that all of these things that come before Christ that they are 
they're, they're types and shadows to help us to understand aspects of what it is to serve God. So for thousand, a thousand years before the coming of Christ, the Israelites worshipped God in a temple, and the grounds of that temple were surrounded by a fence. So outside the fence, everything outside the fence was considered that which is common. Ordinary things are happening out there. People are doing their business. They're going about their days. They're leading their lives. They're falling in love. They're falling out. No, I mean, they're continuing to be in love. And, uh, you know, they're having children and raising children and having fights and squabbles and uh, doing the things that they need to do to live in the ordinary world. It's the common life. But inside those walls, none of those things are happening. Inside those walls, it is a place that is set apart to the service of God. Inside those walls, people should not be squabbling. People are not doing common things. Jesus got so mad, you remember, and he made a whip and drove the money changers and the animal sellers out. Why was he so angry? He was angry because this was supposed to be a holy place in here, and they were bringing the common merchant business from outside and bringing that inside, and it was perverting the purpose Jesus says, God says, my house should be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. So he drove it out. So whatever was inside that fence was considered to be holy. Whatever was outside was considered common. And so that's why the Bible says, and when we just read in, in Ezekiel 42 and 20, that the purpose of that fence was to separate the holy areas from the common. So in other words... Holiness could be determined by where an object was found. You could have a brass pot, ordinary brass pot, and it was manufactured outside the temple grounds, maybe even used in a common purpose beforehand. But it was decided that we were going to dedicate that vessel to the service of the Lord. And so that pot was brought in, and there was a ceremony where it was not just washed, uh, but it was anointed with oil. And there was a process in which uh, it was saying that this is no longer just a brass pot to be used for any purpose, uh, but this is now a holy vessel. Uh, it's only going to be used, it's going to be used exclusively for God in His temple. It is now holy. And so we could see in this context, holiness was connected to two things, where that object was and what its purpose was. That was a pot that had been brought out of the common, cleansed and anointed for a new purpose. Now here's what I need you to understand. Once that pot was brought in and it was made holy, the priest wasn't going to take that pot home and use it to put flowers in it use it for some other mundane purpose. It was now set apart. There's lots of other vessels out there. Use one of those. But this is now holy. This has a higher purpose. It is not common. It is now uncommon, set apart for a holy purpose. And so barriers were erected to keep the common for, from corrupting the holy. Now, there might be thousands of other similar pots out in the community, but there were just a few holy pots that had been consecrated and set apart. Thus, they were uncommon. There was lots out there, but there was only a few that were holy and set apart. That made them rare. That made them valuable. You see, holiness, I want you to understand this. Sometimes people fear the whole concept of holiness as if they're going to lose something. But holiness did not make that vessel less valuable. It made it infinitely more valuable. It was not just one of thousands. It was one of a few special, set-apart, sacred vessels. That's what helps make a passage like this make sense. I'm going to read from the book of Ezra, chapter 1 and verse 7. And talking about some items that were recovered after captivity and brought back. It says that King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hands of Mith Mithredath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shezbazar, sell all of those three times fast, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them. 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives. And then it goes on to talk about other vessels. But I want to just pause there and look at that. 29 knives. Seems like a weird number, 29 Seems like an odd thing to categorize. Surely amongst the Jews, there were tens of thousands of knives, if not hundreds of thousands. 
But the reason why these 29 knives are enumerated and are important is these were not just common knives. These were holy knives that have been set apart, consecrated, special. And so here in the middle of Scripture, it's a big deal to mention that there are just 29 knives. They may not have looked special, but they were special because they were set apart, holy and consecrated, and they were getting them back after 70 years of them being in captivity. We also see another similar incident to help us understand this in the book of Leviticus. There are two sons of the high priest Aaron. Their names are Nadab and Abihu. And they have the task of coming in and burning incense on the altar. That's kind of their primary job. And they, the Bible says it, at some point, they start to play fast and loose with this concept. And they offer up what scripture calls profane fire on God's altar. And God kills them for their breach. And the statement from God seems to indicate that they did this while they were intoxicated and with compromised judgment. So Leviticus 10 and 8 says in response to this, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Why? that you may be able to distinguish between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. See, these young men, in their drunken state, they started to treat the things of God as if they were just common and casual, with, without having the respect for the sacredness, the specialness of what went on in God's house. And God says, I'm not going to put up with that. You, as the priest above all, must be holy, for I am holy. And you need to make sure that whenever you serve me, you do so with a clear head. Uh, And so you can distinguish between what is holy and what is unholy. God stated that those who approached him in Leviticus 10 and 3 must be holy. And that they were to abstain from any kind of alcohol to ensure that their judgment was not compromised. And they knew what was holy and what was common. So if you take that example that we've been looking at for a little bit, that practical example, and you translate it to us, you can think of those temple grounds as representing the kingdom of God for us today. When a person is born again, it is that moment where we used to be common and just doing everything else that the world was doing. But in that moment when we came to God, it was a special moment where we were washed and we were cleansed. But it wasn't just about having a momentary thrill, a momentary spiritual experience. And where a lot of people mess up is they come into a church like this and they may respond, they may feel God's spirit and feel God's love. And they come and they respond and they feel something that is so special and they're so excited by what they feel. But they treat it as if it was just an experience to be had, something to check off the list. That is not what God is looking to do. He's not looking to give you some kind of cheap thrill. Uh, But when God is reaching you, it's because he wants to do a work of transformation. uh, To where he doesn't leave you in the state where you were. uh, With the value that you had before. uh, But he wants to transform you uh, into something that is precious uh, and new. And immeasurably more valuable, something that is holy and set apart for his service. Uh, I'll tell you this, the devil doesn't need more helpers. He's got plenty of them. But Jesus' lament was is that the harvest is ready and there are few laborers for the work of God. See, when God is reaching to you, he's not just giving you something for the moment. uh, But what he's doing is initiating a process uh, that can utterly and completely transform you. uh, And so you can be called to something higher, uh, something more special than anything you've done before. One of the great challenges in our our society, our culture right now, uh, is people are struggling with a lack of meaning. Uh, They feel like they have no purpose for their lives. Uh, And a lot of the reason why people are feeling suicidal 
suicidal ideology, people who are dealing uh, with all kinds of mental issues right now, uh, is because they look at a world and they feel like their life has no purpose. Uh, they have no meaning for their existence. Uh, but God is saying, I want to give you purpose. Uh, I want to give you meaning. Uh, you may have been whatever you were before, uh, but when I'm done with you, uh, you are going to be something that is special, uh, that is set apart, uh, that has a value beyond what can be imagined uh, in this present world. So when God starts that process and the tears begin to flow as we respond to him uh, and we begin to repent of our sins, uh, God forgives us and God cleanses us. Uh, when we are go into the waters of baptism, uh, that sinful past is being buried and gone forever. Uh, and God does not leave us as an empty vessel, uh, but he fills us with his Holy Spirit. Uh, and so now we are full uh, of life and purpose and meaning uh, and power to do what God calls us to do. It is the beginning of holiness in our lives. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. It says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Another word for Satan. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. Be holy, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. See, that thing that we're longing for, not just that meaning, but that sense of connection, to feel that we are loved, wanted, desired. God says, I will do that for you. I'll set you apart and make you holy, and I'm going to be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. God is emphasizing the importance of, of being separated from common or unholy things, unholy living after we have started that process of becoming holy. To put it very plainly, you don't go to all the trouble of cleaning a vessel, cleaning your, who, has a, who out there has a favorite coffee or tea cup that you use all the time? Lots of you, fellow addicts. But you know when you're done with that and you clean it all up yesterday, because I was gone for the day, I left mine with full of water, and then I poured bleach in it to get all of the stain out of it. And then I cleaned and polished up the one in the inside that's stainless steel. It's all shiny and new looking. Oh, I love it. But you don't go to all the trouble of cleaning something up and then drop it in the mud. That defeats the whole purpose of the cleansing. You know, when I go and I've detailed my truck, I don't immediately go looking for mud holes to go ramming through. Like, I want, to, I want it to look pretty. I want it to look like the thing that I am investing my money in. And God is looking for us that when he begins this process in our lives, we don't immediately go right back to the old mud, you know, pig pen of sin and go dive right back into it. Woohoo! One of the meanings of the word holy is to be set apart. That's where God says, come out from among them and be separate. Be set apart. God has set you apart and so that he can use you for a holy purpose. The word holy can also mean pure. We are being purified from sin so that we can now have God in our lives and can have reflect God's purity, show a world that is lost and hurting a better way. And the third definition of holy is, is different. The idea comes from the fact that anyone that God sets apart for his own use is going to be different from a world who doesn't know God. Different values, different beliefs, different lifestyle, different purpose, because they are living on a different plane. They're living for a holy purpose. So God has called us to be set apart from the world, pure in our hearts, our minds, our lifestyle, and to be set apart from the world and so that the world then can see Christ in us. That means you have to erect some barriers in your life to keep the filth of the world from corrupting your new holiness. The Bible, is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but 
The Bible speaks not only about, you know, what God's word says, but also there is a personal conviction. When the Holy Spirit is active in your life, and all of you that have been filled with God's spirit, you know what it's like. The, immediately after you are filled, there are things you become uncomfortable with that you were comfortable with a week ago. I call it uh, the Holy Spirit in your life is often like a conscience on steroids. Like all of a sudden, you're feeling a, what the Scripture calls a conviction. I don't feel comfortable with that anymore. And that is holiness at work in your life. It is your value system of your old life being replaced with God's new value system. You can't be a next-level Christian without embracing God's transformation in your life. You know, there's a lot of, you know, in our the church world today, a lot of people talk about, well, God, doesn't God love us as we are? Yes. But he also loves us too much to leave us that way. He transforms us when we are saved. Do you love your children? Hopefully the answer is yes. Do you want your kids to be brats? No. So you love them, but you don't leave them as they are. Because if you leave them as you are, you have not done your job, which is to parent to shape them, to shape their character, to help to teach them values that are going to help them to be a competent adult. And God wants to do the same thing for us spiritually. A couple of verses that I love, Romans 12 and 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't just go with the flow. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Then 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In both of these cases, the word that is translated transform is the Greek root word that we get the word metamorphosis from. When we are being transformed, means we are metamorphosing from one form to another. We used to be common, but we are being transformed into holy. And there are a lot of people that say, no, I want to, don't mess with me. I want to stay as I am. I want to stay conformed to the world. But understand that from God's perspective, that's like the caterpillar saying, no, I'm better the way I am. And God says, but I want to make you a butterfly. If you want to be a worm, that's your problem. But God says, I can make you something better. I can transform you into something better. And this brings us to what is, I think, the biggest challenge when we begin to talk about holiness. And it's this. I just want to fit in. One of the greatest challenges for Christians, particularly for young people, is that there is so much pressure to fit in. Now, as you get to become an adult, you know, you can be a little bit offbeat, a little bit odd, and it's okay. But in high school, if you're different, it's not fun. And one of the great challenges that we all face as believers is that there is a part of us that doesn't want to stand out, that we don't want to be different, we don't want to be noticed. But I want to give you a little bit of perspective on that today. You see, for thousands of years, people have valued certain stones, certain kinds of metal, precious objects, um, you know, be they decorations or adornment or jewelry, has been made out of precious stones and precious metals. But let me ask you this. Isn't a diamond or a ruby just a rock? Like, I got a rock here. How many carrots is that puppy right there, huh? You see, the problem why this is not what everybody's clamoring to have their, you know, the crown jewels made out of, is that I got this rock out of a big pile of rocks right over there. And we got that big pile of rocks out of a much larger pile of rocks in which there are who knows how many millions of tons of rocks just like this, just in our general area. They're all over the place. People have valued metals like gold or platinum, silver. But isn't gold just a metal? Well, here's a bigger piece of metal. I mean, 
It's even got a ring shape to it. You'd think that people would be clamoring for this nice washer on their finger. Because, I mean, again, that is more metal than what they typically get done in house. And look at that nice big nut there and bolt on it. I mean, that's heavy-duty stuff. I mean, you should feel the heft of that. A lot of metal. But again, and by the way, this metal is stronger than that jewelry metal. I mean, this is tough stuff. This building was made out of stuff like this. Trying to get over the PTSD of that. But what makes diamonds and gold precious is their scarcity. They are uncommon. And that makes them much more valued and valuable than the common stones or metals. In all of human history, it is estimated that less than 209,000 tons of gold have been mined by every person at every place in the world in all of time. 209,000 tons. And this year alone, there will be more than 2.5 million tons of iron that is mined. More than 10 times as much just this year alone. So that tells you that there's lots of iron in the steel that we make out of it. But there's not a lot of gold. There are billions and billions of tons of granite and other rock. They're everywhere. But there are just 1.3 billion carats of diamond in the world. And if you don't understand the math there, it takes... 2,267 carats to make one pound. There are 2,000 pounds to a ton, which means that there are a grand total of 287 tons of diamond in the world. So in other words, there's lots of regular rocks. There are very few diamonds. In fact, there are times when even the precious metals, if there's a lot of them, they become less valuable. The Bible says of Solomon's kingdom that in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Chronicles 9.27, the Bible says the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowlands. So you know when the Bible says that silver was like stones, it means it wasn't very valuable. There's lots of it. People like silver, pff, who cares? When there is a lot of something, it is of little value. But when there's a little of something, it becomes precious. See, you may feel pressure to fit in with the world, to be like everyone else. But those that just go along with the crowd are common. There's a lot of them. Being uncommon gives you value in a world full of common things and common people. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying a dark world doesn't need more darkness. It needs light. A bland world doesn't need more sheeple that are all doing the same thing. It needs flavor. That's why we read in our text, 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You see, when God calls us out of darkness, out of the common, he does make us different. The King James renders that to uh, his own special people. It says, a peculiar people. And, you know, uh, people have always laughed over that. It's like, yeah, look around. <laughs> Definitely some peculiar ones. 
But this actually gives the sense a little better. Peculiar is not used as a pejorative, as a negative, but rather it's something that is special and unique and set apart. We are not different in a negative sense, but we are chosen according to Peter. We have been made royal, holy, special. When God makes us holy, he makes us rare and valuable. And so the command is in 1 Peter 1.13, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to your former lust, as in your ignorance, back when you didn't know better. He says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. I'm going to bring this home before we respond here this morning and just make it practical for a moment. You've noticed we dress differently. We do that because we're trying to follow what God ordains in His Word. Two important principles in God's Word. Modesty is properly covering the body so you can draw attention to God rather than attention to your flesh. We dress for gender distinction, accepting that God has designed us male and female purposely, and we want to maintain that distinction because it's important to God. We speak differently. We don't swear or lie or speak provocatively. There's plenty of common mouths to, stew, to uh, spew filth. Don't worry about it. If you stop swearing, someone else will take over for you. But we are to be uncommon, to be holy, to be the difference maker. You know, the one person that can speak English at your workplace instead of just profanity. We act differently. We're being transformed, and so we can become more compassionate, a little more patient, to have better ethics and more responsible actions. There are plenty of people out there to cheat and lie and to pervert. They don't need more of that. They need more people that can be different. We are a light in the darkness, salt that brings flavor, better flavor to the world. And also we love differently. Our love is not self-serving or manipulative. We don't just love those who we think will bring us status or make us look cool. We speak the truth in love. You see, God wants you to be uncommon, special, rare, holy. He wants to create a metamorphosis in your life to transform you from the commonplace where he found us to something that is special, sacred, and holy. God wants to give your life value. Holiness does not degrade. It elevates. I'm going to invite you to stand with me right now. A lot of times on a Sunday morning, I'm talking more about the process of coming to God and that appeal to come to God for salvation, talking about what God does for us. But today... I felt led to go to a next level kind of message to let us know that there's a reason why God calls us. The reason why you felt that tug to come to church this morning is that God doesn't want to just do something temporarily for a moment in your life, but he wants to transform you into something that is rare and special and beautiful. But here's the deal. God won't force any of it on you. Holiness is a choice. God is the source. I can't be holy on my own. I can't earn salvation on my own. It all flows from Him. But I have to make a choice to open up that channel to God. To start to say in my life, and you know you. I didn't say you do you. I said you know you. The whole point of this message is to stop doing you and start doing Him. Being more like Him. But you know the area where unholiness is a part of your life. Maybe it's in your speech. You know, sometimes we start doing better in our speaking till the moment that we're upset. And our vocabulary transforms. But God can help you with that. Maybe because of an insecurity in your life, you feel like you need to dress in a way that gets you attention. But God wants to do a work of holiness in your life to give you an internal value. 
that isn't reliant on a cheap kind of attention. Maybe you've had some issues with honesty. Honesty with yourself. Honesty with others. And this message is not condemnation. It's a message of hope saying that God can do a work of transformation in your life. You see, it's not me that makes me holy. But rather it is me allowing him and having a desire saying, God, I I know it. I know I have a problem with my mouth when I get upset, when I get frustrated. But I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to be another common dock worker. I want to be more like you. I want to be able to speak in those moments words that speak life rather than damnation. So help me today. And God is ready, willing, and able to do a work in your life to help make you precious, valuable, holy. And so if that's something that you desire in your heart today, I'm going to invite you to come to God and say, God, I need some help today. I do want to be holy. I don't want to be bound by that stuff anymore. I want to be transformed into something special. And if you'll come with a sincere heart, I believe that God is going to meet you around the front of this church today. And he is going to help to further that process of transformation in you. But you are the catalyst. You've got to make a decision. God, I'm ready for change. I'm not going to fight against it, Lord. But I'm going to invite you uh, to come in and to do some tinkering under the hood. To change some things in my life so that I can be holy like you. In Jesus' name.